she read that made it sound radical. <laughs> I'm going to actually go a little bit beyond these verses that were read, and that's unusual because I'm used to kind of staying within the bounds that have been set for me. So. <laughs> Most of you uh, know or are at least familiar with the details of my offenses against the church. I love my partner Val, and she loves me. And I presided over the holy union of Carrie and Carolyn, two wonderful women who are deeply in love. The United Methodist Church considers both of these affirmation, affirmations chargeable offenses. I was found guilty of celebrating the Holy Union because I refused to categorically discriminate against two women who ask for God's blessing on their marriage. And I was found not guilty of being what the United Methodist Church calls a self-avowed practicing homosexual. I was found not guilty, not because I denied that I am a lesbian in a loving, committed 16-year relationship. I was acquitted because I was unwilling in a setting meant to do me harm to reveal the details of my intimate life with my partner. My penalty was a 20-day suspension for discernment, and then in collaboration with conference leadership, I am to initiate a written document for clergy to help resolve issues that harm the clergy covenant, create an adversarial spirit, or lead to future trials. This sentence is complicated and it doesn't lend itself well to um, media sound bites. <laughs> so a lot of folks have been saying to me, I can't tell, is this penalty good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> As I told reporters right after the verdict was handed down, I, um, I feel like I have been sentenced to teach and write, <laughs> something I've already dedicated my ministry to. But honestly, I felt a little like Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Please don't throw me into that briar patch. <laughs> One of the things I had repeated to myself and publicly over the course of the 16-month trial process was that there was a very strong likelihood that I would lose my clergy credentials, a reality that I was at peace with. But what I didn't fully realize until after the trial and in my 20 days of discernment was how much preemptive grieving I had done. In ways that were both subtle and profound, I had spent the better part of a year saying goodbye to my role and my identity as a clergy person. And I did not expect to awaken on the morning of June 24th, the Reverend Amy DeLong. I had the most amazing, brilliant, creative, inspiring trial team imaginable. And those people led by Scott Campbell. Stand up, Scott. <laughs> Those people led by Scott um, saved my credentials. Uh, but more importantly, I hope we have laid the groundwork so that someday all called and qualified queer folk will be able to get clergy credentials. So I like this passage in Luke's Gospel. To set the context a little bit, um, Jesus has been invited to the house of a Pharisee for a bite to eat. And as they're sitting down at the table, the Pharisee is amazed at what a shameless rascal Jesus is. His crime, he sat down for dinner without washing his hands. That's disgusting. <laughs> that kind of abnormal behavior is in complete violation of the Jewish purity laws. 
Well, upon sensing the disapproval of his host, Jesus launches into this scathing and incredibly delightful rebuke of the Pharisees. You offer up your perfect tithes. You spend your time making more and more rules and regulations and restrictions which load people down with burdens they cannot bear. You act like you're holier than everyone else, surrounding yourself with pomp and pageantry, and none of this has anything to do with helping God's people. And now you've just become well-manicured graveyards. Thick green grass on top but dead and rotting just below the surface. Justice has been usurped by your religiosity. Your orthodoxy has become a stumbling block, an obstacle to love and grace. Now, I'm a nonviolent person, but I like it when Jesus gets all old school Batman on the Pharisees. (laughs) Pow, kapow. Though it's not included for our text for today, I would be remiss to not continue on in Luke's gospel. Here's um, what Eugene Peterson says under a, a, a heading entitled, Can't Hide Behind a Religious Mask. By this time, the crowd, unwieldy and stepping on each other's toes, numbered into the thousands. But Jesus' primary concern was his disciples. He said to them, Watch yourselves carefully so you don't get contaminated with Pharisee yeast, Pharisee phoniness. You can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip and your true faith face will be known. You can't whisper one thing in private and preach the opposite in public. I'm speaking to you as dear friends. Don't be bluffed into silence or insincerity by threats from religious bullies. These verses are startling to me because moments after Jesus harangues the Pharisees for being hypocrites and frauds, he warns his disciples that the greatest temptation they will face to be untrue to who they are, to be dishonest about what they know to be true, will come not from somewhere out there, but from within the religious establishment. One of the most poignant moments for me during my trial came actually about a week before the trial. Scott was working on the language of the charges that had been filed against me, and one of the charges was that I had been charged with being a self-avowed practicing homosexual. So Scott started looking for definitions for these words. Self-avowal had, of course, already been defined by the Book of Discipline, paragraph 304.3, footnote number one. (laughs) But Scott couldn't find anywhere a definition for the word practicing. (laughs) Now, if the definition seems obvious, I would need you to think about that for a little bit. Are there any straight people out there? (laughs) Yeah, you don't need to be afraid. Some of my best friends are straight people. (laughs) So for you straight folks, do you ever describe yourself as a self-avowed practicing heterosexual? (laughs) Are you practicing when you're actually engaged in sexual activity? (laughs) Are you still practicing once you've stopped said activity? And if you and your beloved stop having sex altogether, does that mean you're gay? Can you imagine if the breadth and depth of your relationships were reduced to such minutia? If the validity of your love hinged solely on what happens or doesn't happen in the bedroom? So anyhow, Scott's looking for a definition for practicing. And he writes an email to Bishop Clay Lee, who is the presiding bishop, bishop of the trial. Scott says, I'm writing to request that you provide us with a definition of the word practicing. (laughs) The respondent must know what she is being charged with if she is going to be able to defend herself. Does practicing mean, for example, that the respondent, that was me, and, and her partner sometimes hold hands or go to the movies together 
or name each other as beneficiaries on life insurance policies or visit each other's parents at Christmas doesn't mean that they have established a domicile together. We need to know what the church, how the church is using this term if we are going to be able to offer a defense for these charges. Please inform us immediately of your understanding of this word as time is of the essence. <laughs> That's because Scott had like 10 brilliant defenses that all got dismissed in pretrial rulings. So this is like four days before the trial. So he, by that he means we got nothing in the trials in four days. So. <laughs> Well, I don't know what Clay Lee ever wrote back, if he did, but I do remember what Tom Lambrecht wrote back. Tom was the counsel for the church. Some of you know his name. He is one of my annual conference's most strident uh, anti-gay enthusiasts. And Tom um, just left pastoral ministry, almost literally went from my trial to his new job as the vice president and general manager of the Good News Movement. So here was Tom's response to Scott's inquiry. I find it incredible that Reverend DeLong, at this late point in the process that's been going on for over a year, would suddenly want to retract her self-avowal or deny she is a practicing homosexual. However, if Reverend DeLong wants to renounce her domestic partnership and commit to, a, to celibacy and singleness, the church would welcome that development. Now, I don't very often feel like Jesus, but I felt like Jesus just then. I, I was reading it, and I was literally transported back in time, reliving that 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness temptation scene, but instead of being offered all the kingdoms of the world, my tempter was offering me conditional acceptance. Amy, if you renounce your love, if you destroy your family, if you walk out on Val and the kids, if you stop telling the truth and start telling a lie, the church will approve of you. The temptation to succumb to Pharisee phoniness came just as Jesus had warned from within the church, the one place we are told that the truth will set us free. Within the context of the church, there are so many obstacles to authenticity, and this isn't just about gay folks, you know. Anyone who refuses to take the path of least resistance or who doesn't mind rocking the boat or who won't subscribe to business as usual or who tells the truth even when it isn't fashionable knows how much pressure there is to lie, to fudge, to hide, to deny what we know to be true. I get really frustrated when church folk, and by church folk I mean clergy, say to me, I'd love to be a reconciling congregation, but I just don't think my church is ready for that. Luckily, I have my magic hogwash decoder ring. <laughs> and... And I can quickly translate that to mean, I don't have any idea how this would fly in my congregation, but I am too terrified to find out. Too many leaders in the church are terrified of the naysayers, terrified of disagreements, terrified folks will take their money when they leave. Too many clergy are afraid of punishment from the system, of losing credentials and health insurance, or of being accused of breaking the covenant. During my trial process, I was uh, pretty consistently denounced for breaking covenant. I found this to be a curious indictment because in my head, covenant is a mutually agreed upon promise, a rich theological concept about how we are to be in relationship with God and with one another. But for gay people and for our supporters, the word covenant has become abusive. It's a bludgeon that's used to beat us into conformity with conventional wisdom and majority opinion. It's become a mandate to require participation in a conspiracy of silence. There is no covenant that should ever force us to suspend or surrender our conscience. There are so many ways we are gently insidiously cajoled into being nice, 
into keeping quiet in order to avoid conflict and criticism and confrontation. We are coaxed into yielding to the authority of the discipline, which is always convenient because it keeps us from ever having to decide whether we will act with justice or not. I am always stunned at how many clergy, and by clergy I mean bishops, (laughs) will say to me, I know there is nothing wrong with being gay. I know there is nothing wrong with GLBT people being married or being ordained. I know the policies of this church are dead wrong, but I must still uphold the book of discipline. As young, do it again, I like that. As the young people today say, really? Really? Is there any wonder there is a credibility crisis in the church today? When, when, when will we ever learn that as long as we are unwilling to conjure our own courage or act on our good conscience, as long as we collude with mean-spirited laws we know violate the very gospel of Jesus Christ, as long as we are content to simply wait until the institution tells us that discrimination is wrong, as long as we self-censor and allow ourselves to be censored by others, we will always and forever be the very engine which allows the machinery of injustice and oppression to hum along unhindered. Dr. King said we have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. It has been my experience too often in the United Methodist Church that engagement in prophetic ministry gets abandoned the moment we start analyzing the cost-benefit ratio. But faith calls us to risk and to be brave and to prod and protest and defy and dissent even in the face of all the external and internal accounting ledgers which tell us we ought to be cautious and prudent and obedient. We must literally be willing to jeopardize our purses, our power, our prestige, our privilege, and our popularity. That's the hard one. Right now, not someday, not after we retire, but right now, today, or nothing will change. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you've been so preoccupied with the shiny exterior that you've failed to see the corruption that's taken over your interior, and this is usually an intentional blindness designed to protect your posterior. A couple of weeks before the trial, I had lunch with John McDougall. That name might not be familiar to many of you, but John was the clergy person who served as the counsel for Rosemary Denman when she was tried for being a lesbian in the late 80s. Over lunch, John said to me, there was a time when the book of discipline was a guide for principled living. It was a moral compass which helped point us in the direction of faithful living and right relationship. But over time, the book of discipline has changed. We now call it our law book. We have made it into a rigid and inflexible set of rules and regulations and itemized list of corresponding penalties and punishments. And when the book of discipline shifted from a guide to principal living and became our law book, it became the church's very long suicide letter. You're hopeless, you religion scholars, Jesus said. You took the key of knowledge, but instead of unlocking doors, you locked them. Jesus' words in Luke's gospel are meant to help us guard against hypocrisy, to be sure, but they're also words of encouragement and liberation. Be your authentic self. Don't build an outer facade to hide an inner reality. Don't be afraid of what you might lose or what other people might do to you. Just be who you are. And don't get contaminated by those who want to convince you that the mask is more acceptable or better looking than the original face. Don't be bluffed into silence or insincerity by the threats of religious bullies. About a month ago, I logged on to the online version of the Good News magazine. This is something I never do, because search as I may, I can never find the good news. 
<laughs> but curiosity had just gotten the better of me. I wanted to see how the results of my trial were playing out among our conservative brothers and sisters. And there was an op-ed piece that caught my attention. It was written by Karen Booth. Karen is the executive director of the Transforming Movement. These are the folks we know who have the astonishing ability to ignore every shred of scientific, medical, sociological, psychological evidence and claim that gay people can just magically be, be transformed into straight people. So Karen's article was entitled, What I Would Say to Amy DeLong. <laughs> I immediately thought this was an ironic title because Karen was the person who was sitting at my trial Front row, far right. <laughs> and Karen was sitting right in front of the little classroom that has been designated um, the, the, my team's private room. I need to interrupt myself and say, you know, the trial was in Fellowship Hall, and then the Sunday school rooms are all around the edges, and they have cute little names so the kids know where to go on Sunday morning. And so the bishop in his council's room was named um, the Temple Tent, and then um, uh, the, uh, um, Tom Lambrecht and his people, their room was named the Three Kings Theater. <laughs> and then my room and Scott's room was called God's Awesome Creations. <laughs> So anytime, anyhow, every time when I needed to enter my little God's awesome creation room, Karen had to scooch out of the way just a little bit to the left. <laughs> so Karen had like 150 opportunities over the course of the trial to tell me exactly what she wanted to tell me in person, and she never said a word to me. So I'm just saying her article should have been called what I would say about Amy DeLong. <laughs> In her article, she says she hopes someday Reverend DeLong, quote, comprehends the pain and turmoil her actions have caused throughout the worldwide connection. I assume she means this in the exact same way that abolitionists were supposed to comprehend the pain and turmoil that emancipation caused throughout the worldwide slave trade. But in her last paragraph, she says, today I would say to Amy DeLong, God loves you, but does not love what you do. Through your faith, he has given you the power to be sanctified sexually, to turn from sin and experience new and full life. And though the United Methodist Church still is not prepared to help you, I can point you to those who can. That is such a sweet offer. I felt like Jesus again. <laughs> there is so much in that paragraph that I could object to, but the only thing I'm going to take issue with is one word. She says, God loves you, but. That little tiny but feels like bearing false witness against God, which I think is near the beginning of the top ten list of thou shalt nots. <laughs> what blasphemy it feels like to claim that we know the limits of God's love. God loves you, but, and it does not matter, it is absolutely irrelevant what comes next because the but negates everything that came before. After yelling at the Pharisees and the religion scholars, after warning the disciples about the pressure that would face them to mask their true selves, Jesus says to the gathered community, What's the price of two or three canaries? Some loose change, right? But God never overlooks a single one. He pays even greater attention to you down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. Don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Now he doesn't set up provisions he doesn't say, you who are heterosexually oriented are worth a million canaries, or you who have, are celibate in singleness, or you who have been sexually sanctified. <laughs> no conditions, no restrictions. He just says, don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Every attempt to shame us, 
to blame us, to bluff us into silence, every attempt to mask us, to bully us, to frighten us into, into insincerity will fail because we know our worth, right? We know our worth, right? Yes. We know we are God's beloved, named, claimed, and fashioned in the divine image, no but. Say it with me. No, but. We know we are God's beloved, named, claimed, and fashioned in the divine image. No, but. We know our sexuality and our gender identity, hetero, homo, trans, or bi, are all good gifts from God. No, but. We know God created us, loves us completely, and honors the beautiful truth of our lives. No, but. We know we are held fiercely and gently in a love that will never let us go. No, but. We know we are worth more than a million canaries. No, but. Amen.